Thank you to the Apollo astronauts for sharing your story with us. And it makes me think about when we go back to the moon now and put the first female steps onto the lunar regolith, that iconic picture of Buzz Aldrin. We all know the one that I'm thinking of that was taken by Neil Armstrong. And what a lot of people don't know about Buzz Aldrin is that he was also on the Gemini 12 uh, mission and he did multiple spacewalks. But what I like the most is that he actually has a doctorate from MIT. Did you know that? I, I did know that. And it's just one of his many accomplishments. He was also a fighter pilot, an author, coined that, that phrase, magnificent desolation, that has, that has been so widely used to describe the lunar surface and has been a great ongoing vocal proponent for crewed spaceflight and has developed the concept of the Aldrin Cycler, which is a, a viable engineering-based plan for getting humans to Mars and back in, in an affordable and efficient, and efficient manner. But I'd like to take the opportunity, if I may, to highlight a couple of Buzz's truly great accomplishments, which we tend to overlook when we are examining the spaceflight world. Now, we are both science communicators, we're television hosts, we're, we're science writers, and for people like us, I, I, I'm gonna be honest and own up to this, one of the things that we really aspire to is being asked to do a guest spot on Big Bang Theory. And not only has Buzz achieved that, but he has also been granted that single highest accolade in all of pop culture, and that is to appear as himself on The Simpsons. That is a truly great accomplishment. It absolutely is. Probably actually witnessed by about as many people as watch the moon landing when you take into account reruns. So I have to tell you that, that Buzz has, in, in a sense, been part of my life since I was a kid. So I was very fortunate to grow up with eccentric parents who thought that space flight was more important than school. So I was excused from going to school in the late 60s and early 70s. I got to stay home and watch the moon landings. Courtesy of a note from my quite imperious father to my quite drunk British headmaster saying young Jeffrey will be staying home to watch the moon landing. So, so I had this double bonus. I got, to, I got to watch this live on our little black and white telly in South London and I didn't have to go to school. So no wonder I've got such a positive association with spaceflight. More specific than that, my dad wore one of those Omega watches. My dad did too! You're kidding! <laughs> no, I'm dead serious! So, on the back of this watch was inscribed the first watch worn on the moon, and it had Buzz's name on the back of it. So, I was a bit of a Snoopy kid, and I was always looking around and this and that, and that. My dad loved that watch. When he would come home from work every day, he would take the watch off and he'd put it carefully on his dresser. And one time I examined this and I went to him and I said, Dad, why does your watch have Buzz Aldrin's name inscribed on the back? And he said, oh, Buzz gave that to me uh, a while ago. And I, I said, really? I was only a little boy then, but transfixed by this because I'd watched the moon landings. How does my dad know Buzz? Why does my dad have a watch from Buzz Aldrin? And, and my dad was a very mysterious guy. We actually think he was a spy. So... He said, oh, you know, I did some work for NASA in the 60s and 70s, and Buzz gave me that watch as a thank you. So I quizzed Buzz about this. He claimed to have no recollection of it, which is exactly the answer you would give if you had given a watch to a spy as a thank you. So, so there's, there's the mystery. There's the mystery of that and the Buzz Aldrin watch will never be solved. My dad's passed away since. Now I gotta look at my, my dad's watch and that contact my brothers because my older brother is convinced that my dad was a spy also. Really? Absolutely, 100%. And he had an Omega watch. People are gonna think that we staged this, but this, this is extraordinary. Okay, yeah, we've definitely got some power parallel mysteries going on here. But Simon. it is amazing that I have a Neil Armstrong autograph to my dad, and then your dad has a Buzz Aldrin watch. So if only we could get something cool for Michael Collins, we'd have the whole Apollo 11 <laughs> mission covered. 
So before we see the interview with Buzz, I will leave, leave you with one more amusing anecdote, and it is this. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of introducing Buzz's keynote at the International Space Development Conference in Toronto. I did the Friday night keynote. He was doing the Saturday night keynote. So when, when I spoke, he was sitting right there in front of me with with his team and other astronauts. So no pressure, right? You're delivering <laughs> right. your keynote and oh, the great man. Buzz Aldrin sitting, sitting right there, looking perhaps slightly disapproving, or maybe it was just the spotlights. So Saturday, I sit down with him before the dinner with my very copious notes for my, what I think is gonna be my brilliant introduction to Buzz. And, and I said, so uh, Colonel Aldrin, is there, is there anything you'd like me to particularly mention or, or an, anything you don't want me to cover? And he goes, he goes yeah, yeah, I, I just want you to make sure to, to keep it short because I have a lot to get through. So I was a bit taken aback by that and I, I said, oh, okay, certainly, uh, Colonel. I, uh, I'm glad you said that uh, because I, I'm a bit of a talker. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, I know. I saw your speech last night. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, well, thank you very much, Colonel. And he goes, and here, wear this shirt. And he gave me this fantastic uh, uh, Get Yourself to Mars t-shirt, although it had a slightly different phrase, but you know the t-shirt I'm talking about. So I quickly went off backstage and I cut out about 60% of my introduction. And, and after that, it all went, went very well. But, but ladies and gentlemen, my, my modest claim to fame, I was once mildly told off by Buzz Aldrin just before introducing him on stage. And so with that, I invite you to enjoy this interview with the one, the only, the mighty Buzz Aldrin. What do you see as the mission of the National Space Society? It focuses uh, in regions, uh, people uh, who can gather together without traveling very far and support local events, but there's a unity uh, that uh, ties them together. <clears throat> and at one time, uh, of course, it wasn't the National Space Society, it was merged between the uh, L5 Society and, uh, uh, and, and other entities. And, and when Lori Garber asked me to be German, she was executive director, Hugh Downs, he, uh, he and Von Braun started NSS. And it brought a more uh, uh, national opportunity <clears throat> for, for people of lots of different age groups to begin identifying um, and not just going to uh, Star Wars or, or movies or I can't keep up with them uh, myself these days. Uh, not everyone can go to a launch and, and do this. So, uh, so it's a continuity in particular places. We, we have a Space Society of Australia and Kirby Eichen uh, becomes a friend. I looked him up when I visited Australia. Uh, Hugh Downs, supporting governors. He and I were at the North Pole together. <laughs> uh, That's a good bonding experience, uh, I imagine, uh, the North yeah. Pole. And uh, I went scuba diving with Werner von Braun. Was he a good diver? Did he like being underwater? Or is his head always in the sky? Well, I was leading the flight underwater and we were picking up poker chips. Really? Yeah, and the idea was to move along as, and see what you could find as you're navigating. There are a lot of organizations that, uh, that have been a joy for me uh, to be with, uh, but I think uh, the National Space Society is one that is available to all, and uh, you don't have to, to dress up with a funny outfit uh, <laughs> to be a member, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's pretty serious and it goes into a lot of different branches and, and backgrounds and disciplines. <clears throat> but I think NSS really uh, has, has an appeal and, uh, and should have a presence in uh, most of the uh, professional societies, at least in letting people know or help, getting them to help uh, spread the word around to maybe the younger, but it's not just the younger, it's uh, maybe the people who are trying to get recognition because their company isn't quite big enough. 
What do you What do you think is a good way to, to engage with people who are interested in space, but but just don't know about us or, or don't don't feel that it's something that a, that a that a, a civilian, an ordinary person, could get involved with? How, how do we How do we make this uh, engagement in in space attractive and easy for new people? Uh, well, space is just a different way of doing things, of getting somewhere. Uh, you don't have to build railroad tracks, you don't have to go plowing through the, the mud or whatever, but you get into orbit and uh, you get there, and you'll stay there for a while. Uh, you better bring along some air and some food and some way to get back down. Uh, but that's what makes uh, the space society. Uh, it's not a society of been, of people who've been there particularly. You may have noticed that we have an enormous number of students here from all over the world, enthusiastic young space students. That, that's, that's quite a recent, uh, and they seem to be uh, uniform too. I know, they're, they're very well vacation. dressed and well yeah. behaved. So I, I grew up in the UK, I'm, I'm an American citizen, but my parents were very international. I grew up in the UK and I had to wear the tie and the blazer. So I, so I, <laughs> I see the kids and I go, I can relate guys, I used to have to, have to dress like that. But the, the enthusiasm and, and the, the forward thinking of these kids really impresses me. And it's one of the things I love about the NSS is we have this very international flavor. Do you, do you feel that we benefit from, from internationalism? For what, what is your view on, on international co cooperation between countries in, in space exploration in general? Well, I think it's, it's, it's great. Uh, and uh, right now I'm uh, very much interested in dealing with uh, an international group. And, uh, and I heard people discuss this uh, over in China how should we come together? Should, uh, should everybody join together? Uh, should it be one, one region? Should one co country bring all of them together? And I listened, and, and I kept getting on the edge of my chair. And I said, wait, wait, wait a minute, have you ever thought of bringing together the capable nations of getting together to do something. You know, everybody's not capable of doing those things. But if you let everybody have a, a, a vote because they're a member, uh, that's, that's not too good. But if you let it be dominated by a, a region or wanted to do a whole lot of thinking about this because uh, right now, <clears throat> It took a while to reason that a race, which was what Apollo was, no, I, I think it was set off to be an advance of technology where we, this nation, was behind. And of course, it became uh, a race because we put a destination uh, into it. Uh, but it, it can become quite wasteful when there's a competition. If, if you're interested in doing things jointly together, it's best to compete at the design level, pick the best design, then cooperate at the operational level where you carry out things. Uh, so, th so that way we get, we get the brightest minds yeah. coming up with their own ideas, we pick the best one, and then we take the, the industry and the resources to make the best one. And, and, and I guess maybe that translates to chapters who are do, doing something and they compete for the design level and you pick out the best one and then you go to work with that one. Can, can we manage that as people to actually <laughs> pick what's best for us collectively? It's, it's a noble aim. Do, do you think we can, we can get there through international cooperation? Well, when you, when you get into that, uh, an awful lot depends on uh, uh, who can pay the most, <laughs> who has the talent to do these things. And, uh, and that certainly uh, comes into uh, my crucial analysis right now 
that we got five capable nations, the US, Europe, Russia, Japan, and China. And in some order, and the order is that the US has the, the brains and the desire uh, and the reputation to want to unify so we can maybe get that point across uh, right now because of this decisions and freedoms. Uh, the Europeans have been close enough uh, so they have an agreement with the Russians to work together at the moon. And the Europeans, their astronauts, are learning Chinese language because they have got some agreement with the Chinese. And, uh, well, we want to, America's the greatest, so we <laughs> want to be involved. And Japan kind of will sort of go along. Uh, but it's very crucial to not have a competition uh, with China. Uh, I, I think we've already seen that uh, with Russia we can work together <clears throat> and there are, uh, are ways that uh, may not be too beneficial for them and, and for us, no matter whether they get good rocket engines or, or, or what. But, but to start off international relations with uh, uh, a competitiveness in space. And uh, it, it gets into determining uh, the rapidity of wanting to do certain coalitions of these nations. And uh, I don't want to really get into that and why. And there, there are other things that uh, uh, are influencing us today, and that's the aging of certain components of our uh, space program that have been initiated uh, in the past, and they're getting older, or they haven't quite come to fruition yet. And uh, there are various political reasons why uh, each one kind of wants to, uh, to, to keep going. And it makes it difficult to discontinue unless you got a better idea. And unless whoever's going to lose, you got something better for them to get into. Now, nobody wants to change. What are, what are the better ideas? What, what would you like to see us do in, in terms of space exploration and development? Where, where do you think we could best focus our energies? Well, uh, I, I don't think that many people uh, 30, 40 years ago ever thought we, if we we're going to get into reusability, it would be the first stage of the rocket. Uh, I got involved in, uh, in flyback boosters that land on a runway, one way of bringing something back. <clears throat> uh, but a spacecraft goes and does something, it's a lander, and we leave it there. Or uh, we, we don't go and try and use a lander at the moon again, or no, we want to go to a different place. We use designs similar, but uh, they come back and they land in the ocean, and they're not really quite so suitable. Um, but but you can uh, seg segment the areas uh, where it is appropriate to to reuse something, is how you can get it to where you can uh, make it readily available. And there's sometimes when uh, when a stage of a rocket goes somewhere. Uh, sometimes it's inconvenient to, to turn it around and, and bring it back, but there, there are always different ways if, if, if you can open your mind and think. And this, this, I think, brings up what I hope comes out of the togetherness of NSS, and that's uh, the exchange of ideas that stimulate something I didn't think of before, because he just mentioned something. Maybe I got a good idea. So it's the, maybe the competition of, uh, just because we're doing it that way, that doesn't mean there might not be a better way of, of doing something. When I first 
started looking at rendezvous, I wasn't at all satisfied that the people knew what in the world they were doing. Uh, but it was so simple and basic. Now, of course, being in one airplane and trying to catch another airplane, that gives you a little advantage in thinking about uh, things. Uh, and I think the various backgrounds that, that diverse people have when they come together can look at somebody else's problem that he's been stuck in the rut about and he may think of something and we call that out-of-the-box thinking. Um, Do you feel that's a, that's a product of different backgrounds and different experiences, different cultural viewpoints? We come together and we're, are we better at problem solving as an international group? Mm, well, uh, I, I think the inventiveness of the Western societies uh, uh, have, have, for various reasons, needed to come up with uh, maybe better ways, maybe a freer society. Uh, uh, I think in the Asian world, it it has somewhat been predominated by uh, uh, memorizing something or rote learning. This is something I want you to remember how to do that. Instead of, I got something here, I want you to find out a better way to do it. So it's easy for us to get perhaps stuck in the familiar, we, we, we know the system, there, there's inertia, and, and you have a very inventive an in innovative mind, you have an original way of, of looking at things, and I know you said thinking outside of the box. How do you, how do you, how do you train your mind to do that? Is this, is this a conscious thing? That you I think? just told you. Well, I, but I mean you personally, mm. uh, as, uh, is, is this a daily exercise for you? You're always looking for the next thing? You're, I mean, you're, you're a very innovative person. Yeah, but you can bark up the wrong tree, and you can follow something doggedly uh, I gotta make this work no matter what. And uh, then you find out it was not meant to be. Uh, and there, there are a lot of blind alleys in, in uh, a new business uh, like space where uh, mass, velocity, uh, duration, consumables, uh, all, all of these things that are variable, uh, you go somewhere, how are you going to get back, and uh, what do you need? All, all of these sort of come in to play. It's not just a quick, uh, how do I do this better? Because that may snowball into, into um, and I'm finding route right now, to me, what is very satisfying is that when I make a change here, I can do it because of this one, and then this one plays into that one, and pretty soon uh, it all, I hope, fits together. And I don't think if you just look at this one, how do I do that best, that you're going to see the big picture at all. And uh, uh, I don't know, I, I just feel I'm so fortunate to think that I have that. <laughs> Now all I have to do is convince other people <laughs> that I'm right. <laughs> it's it's a noble aim. So we're we're at an exciting time in, in space flight now. We have we have all these independent groups starting. We've got space tourism. We're so close. We're so yeah. close to asteroid mining. How, how do you feel about this 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 enormous transformation of which the NSS has, in in a sense, kept the the dream alive to a degree all, all mm. these years and it encouraged these small companies. And now we go to a thing like ISDC. And it's full of independent space flight companies, all with their own yeah. ideas. What, what do you think? Are you excited? Uh, yeah, sometimes I get focused on one thing, and, and one was tourism. Uh, how do we get uh, people want to do something dangerous? Well, there's a thrill, but yeah, there's a hazard to it, and uh, there's a notoriety. And uh, after a while, people will uh, adjust to that, look at the odds, and uh, you know, so there's somebody who's going to want, want to walk the tightrope from one building to another. There's somebody who's going to want to jump out of an airplane. 
not me, if the engine's working, <laughs> I want to stay in the airplane. So you, uh, you find that there's a, just a big uh, pool to, to choose from, and uh, uh, so I think each, each person somehow has to feel what is your niche, and sometimes I've been asked, well, what advice would you give? Well, uh, stretch out your arms, uh, engage so many things as you go through life, pick out the ones and throw away the other ones and uh, be ready to uh, change horses if you need to. It's, uh, it's a very inspiring message. Let's talk about something that's near and dear to your heart. Let, let's, talk, let's talk about Mars. Why should we go to Mars? Someone will. Uh, why not us? Uh, when the time is right, and a number of years ago we were caught up with enthusiasm, and oh, we'll get to Mars at a normal pace in the mid-80s, 1980s. If we speed it up, maybe the early. But if we are just kind of slow about it, it'll be 1990 or something like that. Man, that <laughs> passed us by so fast. Uh, and a lot depends on, on um, the national priorities and whether there are other diversions and the leadership. Uh, and it's troubling when when there's such a, uh, a dispute about the leadership and uh, it's regrettable that there's uh, a revision with major administration changes. Uh, there really needs to be more of a continuity rather than, oh, I want to put my brand on, on what's going to happen. Uh, we, we have, uh, as I can see it, we've just uh, embarked on uh, a station and reusability in the shuttle. And one kind of fed on the other, and uh, the ways of getting internationals and getting Congress behind it meant certain compromises and uh, uh, and and to get back to tourism uh, there was an opportunity for the US to build a crew return vehicle that would take people up and crew return and it would leave them up there uh, Opportunities will come and, and they'll be taken advantage of. And we've missed a good number, I think. Um, I can project ahead and, uh, and kind of think that maybe in retrospect, uh, a number of decisions have not been as good as they could have been. And I was very motivated at one time to have a think tank that would look at all the inflection points that we were involved in and look at each one and a decision was made and now was it a good one or not so good? Let's learn from it and, uh, and look at all of these and um, there are a lot of opportunities that were lost for a lot of, a lot of reasons. I, I know there are many people that are just in love with the shuttle but I think in, in the future it will prove to be a diversion that was not quite worth the time and the effort to move in that direction and then to have nothing uh, kind of left over. And uh, I think the space station in some ways uh, fits into that. It, it's uh, reached a point now where uh, whatever the original lifetime of it was, 
It was 2016, then 2020, 2024, and now I'm freely here, 2028, and uh, things are getting old. <laughs> and uh, they're not gonna, and besides, you do something there, it means you can't do something somewhere else uh, in a different way. And it's expensive and we want to privatize it, it's too expensive. Except if you, and once you put something there, uh, it's there. You, you can't be moving it around. Uh, and so, I'm not sure that all the things that we came up with uh, that made Apollo work, lunar orbit rendezvous, instead of one ship getting into orbit and then doing most everything, that was the big power way of doing it. The sophisticated way was splitting things apart and uh, throwing things away, not bringing them all back, leaving one on the surface, and uh, the only thing that returns is the capsule that the crew's in. Uh, well, we're learning how to do things quite a bit different, and, uh, and I don't think we're, uh, we've reached the limit at all. Uh, I mean, I look at, we've got a, and we've got something that has to adjust to the surface of the moon from orbit. Well, that's a, that's a lander. And what's in between uh, kind of goes from space to space and try and make one do the other or do all uh, may not be the cleverest way, but I'm, I'm just giving you some examples of thinking differently uh, and then seeing whether it leads to something uh, that makes sense. I love that. I'd like you to, I'd like you to use your your fantastic imagination that has stayed so active in space flight and, and dream big for me, the, the future. Where, what do you want to see? Where do you want us to go? What should, what should we do? What should our biggest goal in space flight be? What, what's the message that you want us to get across to the world of space flight? Um, resources that we don't have on Earth, um, they're going to be very valuable. Now, how much we can use the lower gravity, the absence of an atmosphere to our advantage uh, on the moon, uh, I, th I think we're gonna find that out. It's not a place where uh, when you go there, it's so hard to get back that uh, you're gonna wanna stay a long time. It's it consumables. Because I think when you go there, that you come back and a new crew and the old crew comes back. Um, I'm not sure that that's fully accepted now. Uh, now Mars is a different case. Uh, what we did, when you really analyze it at the moon, we spent two guys for one day. Two, three months later, two eyes for one day. We had a little interruption, didn't quite work out, so it six, seven months to get two eyes for one day. And we got a little bold, we put a little mobility in it. So at the end, when the Vietnam War and other things kind of ran us out of money, we had six out of seven successful launch and landing and back. Uh, and we got two guys for three days, and nobody's been back since. Now that's a visit, and a very short visit, and a long time in between, and we went to different places. Now Mars, you're gonna have a much different situation. Uh, back in the old days, I used to hate it when I'd hear somebody say back in the old days. Uh, we thought, well, maybe we'd go to Mars and stay 20 days or 30 days. Uh, doesn't work that way. Very expensive getting there. You're you're leaving uh, too late to get there, and you're and you're leaving too early 
to only have a short time there. So that didn't last. But if you go at the best time and fuel, and you come be back at the best time and fuel, you got about a year and a half. And it's vacant for six months, eight months, depending on how energetic. Uh, but that's a visit. And it's an economic visit. But you visit, you visit, you visit. That's not accumulating too much. Well, you can visit, stay there, and somebody else comes, but then you go back home. So everybody who goes comes back home. Well, that is four and a half years staying there, or seven and a half, or ten. From a coup point of view and utility, uh, that's not too good. You're not going to go back and do it again. Uh, and, and if the same number of people go that come back, you have a fixed steady state and you never get any higher than that. So it's not too good from a crew point of view. You pay for getting people there, you pay for getting them back, and it's not a red-hot presidential commitment. So a visit isn't, Occupy isn't. I think we can get away with a commitment to an Occupy because it sounds better, because <laughs> uh, that's what we should do at the moon. You don't need to emigrate and stay there the rest of your life. But when you really look at the, the, the advantages of going there, paying for somebody to go there, paying for somebody to go here, again, you don't have to bring them back. And uh, each one that goes there knows what he's getting into, right from the very beginning. And he either likes it or he doesn't like it. So there's, there's a, a kind of a crew advantage if, I mean, it, it, it's not one crew goes, comes back, another one goes, but then the third one goes, and they become the pilgrims, the pioneers, of their country or of humanity, and the other two, uh, just the, the golfers. <laughs> and I really think that the, the advantage is so much, uh, especially since we got a moon, and we can do all, all the things we need to at the moon, the critical things, so that when we go to Mars, we know what we're doing, or we intentionally get to do things there. We don't do the toughest things there. We do things that are, are, are similar to what we simulated here. And uh, then when we do it, uh, we've tested things so much that we know it's going to work the first time it gets there. And there are ways of assuring this. And now just look at the crew position, look at the cost, and look at the presidential commitment. It isn't going to happen until two more presidents, and they may chicken out by then. <laughs> but, uh, and I think this is the kind of analysis uh, that somebody has to go through and then say, oh, you're wrong. This isn't going to be important, or this isn't. But when, uh, when the last time you flew in space is getting pretty, pretty close to 50 years ago, you got a lot of time to think about these things. <laughs> well, yeah, and you've been doing a lot of thinking. So, so next year, it, it is 50 years since a, a pretty spectacular adventure you went on. Where would you like to see us 50 years after that? Where, 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 sh where should we be on the, on the 100th anniversary? Many breakthroughs, speed, propulsion, uh, the limitations of the human body. And I've given a lot of thought to what those are and how we can deal with them. Uh, and because of uh, some of my own uh, experiences and families, I really think that mental health may be very well the most critical thing that we have to uh, uh, take into account from the very early stages especially if we're going to talk about migrating. And that's better than uh, a permanent settlement, 
Heck, you can visit your settlement many times before you decide to make it permanent or colonize. You decide after a while, I'll colonize. I don't know what the right word is, uh, though I know what the wrong word is one way. I just do not like the use of that. And, um, and I sometimes chide the people that say, uh, oh man, we got to get there in a hurry. Uh, we got to get there in weeks, not months. So I said to a congressman, uh, if you're going to spend the rest of your life there, why do you care how long it takes you to get there? <laughs> but some people feel that they're responsible for, for all these big decisions and they don't want to be a part of stranding somebody somewhere else. That's his decision. That's the government's. That's the world's decision to see whether there are people that fit into uh, the expansion outward. And, and I've led up to uh, a, a phrase that uh, I was given I don't want to take credit for everything. <laughs> uh, to a phrase I was given to somebody who hoped to work on a speech. We explore or we expire. One of the two. We can take our choice. That's so wonderful. I, I think that's, that's a great place to end. Is, unless there's anything else that, that no, you wanted to I'm say. No, I'm Thank you so much. Greetings from Island of the Gods, Bali, Indonesia. My name is Anna Camaro, and I'm the founder of Antrexa Space Global. I've been mesmerized by the fastness of the galaxy and how we're nothing but a speck of dust. I went to Baikonur to see the Soyuz rocket launch, and I believe that everyone should experience all of these inspiring moments in their lives so that we can increase the collective consciousness for humankind. I created Antarexa, a space portal that focuses on increasing Indonesia's interest and growing awareness of the space industry. My goal is to inspire the Artemis generation and to identify and empower local talents so that Indonesia can contribute to the growing global space economy. Through international cooperations, I hope to learn and grow from all of you, the global space community, so that together we can become an advanced space society. Come meet me in Bali for a magical astrotourism or a space camp. Last but not least, I would like to thank the National Space Society and Dr. Sion Proctor for this opportunity to be a part of an amazing global event from Bali, Indonesia. Om Swastiastu! Yeah.